Welcome to Fat Chicks on Top. This podcast contains frank discussions about the body, sexuality, and occasionally uses swear words, which may not be appropriate for people under the age of 18. This podcast also uses facts, statistics, and mathematics, which may not be appropriate for liberal arts majors. And this podcast relies on science and reality, which may not be appropriate for evangelicals. Welcome to Fat Chicks on Top. You're here with your host, Auntie Vice, and we are thrilled today to have Clarkisha Kent on. She is an author, a cultural critic. You may have come across her work on uh, The Root, on Entertainment Tonight, on Essence. Like, you have a huge publishing list, and she has a new book coming out this year. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's so good to have you. So for our readers who may be less familiar with your work, why don't you get a little overview of what you've been doing for the last several years? Oh, great question. Okay, so definitely being like a chaos um, agent on Twitter. That was probably my favorite pastime in the last couple of years, which is why I'm very annoyed about the rat taking over the bird app. But, you know, all good things have to, you know, all good things have to come to an end. Besides that, um, you're right. I have uh, written for Essence, The Root, Entertainment Weekly, Galdam, uh, Paper Magazine. Like, if you've come across it in print or online, I've probably written for the publication. It's like a 50 50 chance. Um, and then, besides that, you know, um, I was working on a handful of stories, and then my agent, Slid into my DMs, Claire Draper, everyone, slid into my DMs in about, I think it was like 2018, 2019. Um, and they recommended that, you know, before I get to my other nice stories, right, including my Western that I got planned, I should, you know, try my hand at a memoir first. And I was like, okay. So that's how we got here, essentially. Um, so I'm super excited for everyone to be introduced to my memoir, Fat Off, Fat On, A Big Bitch Manifesto. And, you know, March can't get here fast enough. And I love A Big Bitch Manifesto. Like, we've needed these out in the world. So when you were approaching putting your manifesto together, what was the root of that manifesto? Um, Definitely trying to make sure that the, actually the central thing is like, not just explaining fat phobia because you know we're not walking dictionaries or encyclopedias on fat phobia right but just being like hey this is a concept this is fat phobia but it's beyond what you're thinking right people say fat phobia and it's just like the i think the first thing that probably comes into their minds is like oh just people make funny make, people making fun of you for being fat the names like basically what is happening with Lizzo right now, if we're being honest, but it like goes beyond that. Like there's the medical industry, um, there's colorism within families, right? Um, there's the church and how the church and religion exacerbates everything, right? There's the education system. So much of fat phobia is not just name calling. Um, it's systemic. You know, there are several different entities and institutions um, that draw power from enforcing fat phobia, but particularly racialized fat phobia, which gets left out of the conversation a lot. So that's what I was thinking when I put everything together. Um, and then because I had that like central point, I was like, OK, now I can like add some like juicy bits <laughs> on top of it, you know, to kind of properly um, give it some window dressing so people can like find an easy way or easy entry point into that story and then into those points that I'm making underneath the stories. There's so much there to break down because as you point out, it's incredibly complicated. And as you add, not just being fat, but a dark skinned queer person who's struggled with mental illness, like 
it's exhausting just thinking of all the strands you have to break down. So let's just start with with one of the more painful things, but it, it comes up a lot for our our guest is how is it played out in the healthcare in setting for you? For me, it's a lot of I hate to give my father credit because uh, mm, as y'all will read in my book, that's not a good person, clearly. But um, he was someone who worked in the healthcare in- industry. Um, and he told me, you know, to my face, he's like, listen, you are black, you are fat. They're going to use every excuse in the book not to treat you or if they have to treat you, not to treat you well. So he's like, whenever you go in, especially with the pain skill, a lot of my, you know, spoonies and disabled friends are familiar with that pain skill, right? He's like, when you go in and they're like, oh, what's your pain scale from one to 10? He's like, say like 50, you know, say what just, he was like, ju- j- like really embellished that shit. He's like, I don't care what you say, make sure they get you admitted and into that room. So for me, it's one of those things like, because he is who he is, I was like, okay, you just saying that, right? You just saying that to like, you know. Not this not, gaslight's not the word, but like to like scare scare me about the process. But when I not only told my AC on college, but I had suffered an issue where basically my gallbladder was just done. Like she up and quit on me. Um, and I went into the hospital and I was telling them like, hey, so my gallbladder's done. I knew the symptoms because my mother had suffered the same symptoms many, many moons ago, which also was frustrating. Come like, I'm about 20 years early to this, but okay, whatever. So they did not, they didn't take me serious. It was a lot of like gaslighting about, again, my pain scale and, you know, the fact that I'm a woman, right? So they're like, oh, it could be, you know, this or that. Like maybe something's wrong with your uterus, da, 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 da. And even if that's the case, that's still serious if something is wrong with my uterus, right? Right. So- Yeah, they sent me home the first time with just an ibuprofen tab. And I was like, cool. So I came in, I think like 48, 72 hours later, and I just had a bitch fit in the the ear. I was just like, you know what? Today, I'm just going to put on a performance and I'm going to get admitted. So I remember getting in there and they tried to give me the same spiel. So I just fell out. Like, I fell out like I was in church and just started this whole thing where I was just like, oh, my God, I'm in such pain. Like, and it's ridiculous that I had to do that. But it's just like they will literally use any excuse to not treat you at all or as a human being, period. So that's my experience um, with being, you know, fat and black, especially in a hospital. I think the other thing would be, you know, just random doctors making their comments about BMI and weight or whatever. But I never put too much into that after a certain age because I'm like, I am black. Like y'all are basing that off of some pretty racist racist statistics. So I'm just not, I'm just, I'm opting out. So yeah, that'd be my experience like medically. And for our listeners who don't know, gallbladder pain is fucking ridiculous. Like it, it rates much higher than kidney stones or you know heart it's right it's higher than a heart attack and they just with women especially it's like oh you know it could be anything just go home with yeah. the ibuprofen t- i'm like okay you could at least give me like two maybe like one <laughs> and they give me one and i was like it's, hmm, okay so this is what we're not gonna do <laughs> yeah yeah, when I went in with it, they said, well, you probably just strained your ribs. Just roll a tennis ball over it. So now I have fantasies of taking those tennis ball shooters and, like, pummeling doctors to death because, fuck you, it's ridiculous. It's not a little ouchy, you know? Yeah, no, it's it's crazy. You've also had to deal with some mental health stuff. How is how is finding a therapist? Because I love, I, I think it was... Um, Ashley Black, who did this skit with, you know, her biggest fantasy was a black female therapist who's in network. That's like worse, harder to find than a unicorn. How has your experience been finding help in the mental health areas? Well, um, very, very, very tedious, very tenuous. You know, I also have hyper specific criteria when I'm looking. It's not enough for me to have a black therapist. They either have to be a woman or like a non-man, um, they have to understand how colorism works. They have to understand how fat phobia works. Like all these 
of my all of my experiences that just have to be knowledgeable on. So as you could probably guess, very hard, very hard. But I lucked out, I think it was last year, early this year, where I found a therapist, black therapist. Um, and she I shit you not, she was doing her, I think her thesis slash dissertation on like how um colorism and fat phobia like work together as an oppressive force and i was just like there's no way i just i just looked upon this lady i'm i'm shook it i was so happy i was like the fact that i found her like crazy like i this this one you know like once in a lifetime like synchronization of like finding someone who was on the same wavelength as you it's not all perfect. I think sometimes she got a tendency to do a little bit too much devil advocate, you know, being the devil, devil's advocate. But, you know, it's usually, you know, out of um, concern and trying to raise a, like a point that I actually overlooked. So prior to that, though, it was, it's very hard. Um, it's very hard because I would get some of the things checked off on my list, but not all of them. And like you mentioned, trying to navigate this shitty healthcare system and their deductibles and their premiums. It's yeah, it's been a mess. And honestly, I wouldn't wish you on my worst enemy because even if you find somebody who works for you, then you got to worry not just about the pricing, but also meds if you need them. Cause I'm on some, this industry really just likes to nickel and dime you and, bleed you dry any way they can you know they call it a business for a reason and it's a sick because so many medical trials are done on cis white men um under 45 right like if you're not in that model there's probably very few people like you that have been studied on a medication how has it been taking have they worked or is it a lot of trial and error uh, do you use alternative medicines so um I lucked out in that like two therapists ago because I'm, you know, I'm not in California anymore. I initially was and now I'm in uh, Virginia. And I lucked out in that my like first or second had just picked out the perfect bipolar like meds for me. I don't know how she did. She just, she was just like, okay, we're going to try this one. And I'm on Lamictal, right? Slash Lamictogen. I think that's the generic version. Mm -hmm. Um, So she picked that one and like we, we, you know, I used it. She monitored me for a couple, monitor, monitored, excuse me, me for a couple of weeks. And I was Gucci, you know, my sleep had improved because like I could not sleep. That was bad. And, you know, my mood was stabilized and I was good. So yeah, we looked at the first time. The second round of meds came with um, my ADHD diagnosis that definitely happened last mm. year. So that's been kind of rough because of the Adderall shortage. Shortage, I put in quotations, I hope you all know. <laughs> shortage, then like trying to see if I can try um, things like Rid Ritalin or I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to fuck this up. But I think it's VNAs, VY. It's like VYNASE. I think it's like mm. a newer med but yeah. i haven't i haven't gotten to that one because it's so expensive and there's no generic version yet so that that round of meds have been hard and because of the shortage quotation marks um i've just had to go without it it's not ideal but i'm like if i have to pick and choose which medicine i definitely am not gonna part with is definitely the lamitrogen like i'm not parting with that one that one has like functionally changed my life now, I don't like being unmedicated uh, for ADHD, but there are things I personally can do. Can't speak for anyone else, but I personally can do that can help me focus a little bit, you know, a little bit. So both with bipolar and ADHD, these are two things that for a lot of folks, uh, they experience a really hard time getting diagnosed especially if you're in any sort of minority category. I was told it was because I was bisexual and that's not real. I just need to come out as a lesbian and my bipolar would go away. <laughs> what? And then I was told the, the psychotic hallucinations would go away if I changed to a gender appropriate major, like English. And all I could think is you think lesbian English majors are the pinnacle of mental health. Like, how can I not laugh in your face? Um, right. 
Like, you are mistaken. <laughs> for right? Right. So, and for a lot of it, especially if you're diagnosed as an adult, they, they think you're trying to make up excuses. Has it gotten any better? Was it able, were you able to go in and say, look, this is going on? And they said, yeah, this is legit. Or did you get kind of, nah, you're a woman. This is, yeah. you, if you, you take your, your, my doll, you'll be fine. <laughs> I, I'm glad you brought that up. So, um, this is me. I don't want to say endorsing self-diagnosing because you know that verbiage is weird but i will say that uh more of us need to look into that because of these racist systems that's how i got my two diagnoses for both my bp2 disorder and for my adhd diagnosis i researched both of them very very heavily because the first time around i thought i might have ocd or maybe um bpd like there's a couple Mm -hmm. of like um, more suspects in addition to bipolar disorder. Um, and I narrowed it down to about two. And then I went to my psychiatrist about them and she helped me like narrow down to bipolar disorder. Um, and then it was the same thing with ADHD. I had like suspected many moons ago, um, but it's my sister who like when, when we were living together back in Maryland, she like noticed some things that are I was doing that I noticed, like leaving cabinets open, time blindness, like, you know, the whole starting a task and then pausing and then going to do another task and then pausing. And you're like, wait, I forgot to like take the trash out and then doing that. And then meanwhile, like you have the rice on the stove and now it's burning because you forgot you were (laughs) cooking the rice. So after she put all those together, I took those examples that she cited. um, And then like the written um, research I had done, including like, some online tests I had taken, like tests that like actual like psychologists and psychiatrists had put time into. And then, you know, I went to my, again, psychiatrist, like, here's the evidence. I just need you to sign off on this. And she's like, wow, you did your homework. I'm like, yeah, because I don't really have time to go back and forth with people. I've already lost enough time. Like I'm almost 30. Isn't I have had enough time not knowing what's going on up here. So um, that's always my thing. Now, do I think that people like me or you should have to like go through pages and pages and pages of research to get a diagnosis? No. But again, we know the type of medical system that we have to deal with. Like, look at what you just told me. Like, because you bisexual, like, you mentally ill, like, what does one have to do with the other? Like, okay. Cool. And yeah, and it only compounds the the more non-normative you are, right? The further away you are from that thin white cis dude, the harder it gets to get anybody to listen to you. So yeah, you end up having to do a crap ton of research to get any type of help in the medical system, which is so frustrating. So if you were to redo medical education, what would you tell med schools to do? If I were to redo medical education throw out your existing textbooks because they're all fucking racist (laughs) throw out your existing med books we'd have to start there i think people get stuck trying to improve or reform stuff and kind of they they live in denial of the fact that oftentimes you just have to throw like the whole whole thing away and start over so i would definitely start with that um and then once we get rid of that shit, I'll be like, hey, so get to know your patients. I know that like seems super obvious, but like people's pain scale, especially since we keep talking about that scale, is going to vary from person to person to person to person, right? So if you prick me with the needle, like the standard needle, I'm not going to be like, it's it's nothing for me. It's like, like a mosquito bite. I'm not really going to feel it. But like, my cousin, let's say you prick her with a needle and that's like a, a nine for her. Now she's crying and throwing up because you didn't think to mm-hmm. ask, like, maybe does this hurt, right? So um, it's one of those things where, like, uh, a lot of these doctors just run on their own racist assumptions or, unfortunately, racist assumptions that they've learned in these schools. So that literally be my first order of business, just throwing all those books out so we can lay down a new foundation um, for learning because what already exists is not very great. Yeah, I've been reading tweets of my existing um, medical mutuals 
And some of these books that I just mentioned, like, you would just be shocked at what is in these books just written in print about how Black people, like, how they do with pain, fat people, how they deal with pain. Like, just, you just be, you just be shocked by what is just, just printed in plain day and what is regarded as law for them, right? So, yeah, that'd be my first order of business. You got to throw the books away. That's the first thing. Yeah, no, you mentioned those. And when you we read it, you're like, holy crap, this is what they're teaching people. So even if you come in having dealt with some of your racism, they're like, no, nah, that was wrong. Come back to it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, so you brought up colorism several times, and you've had the joy of living in California and now in Virginia, two very different places culturally. Is it the same, different? How are you experiencing the way you're received in public and such in, in both places? They're different. They're very different. I was in Anaheim first when I was in California and then Los Angeles. Like I landed in Anaheim, then went to Los Angeles. Extremely colorist. Any <laughs> Black person who lives out there will tell you how colorist it is. It was very nasty. I talk about that a little bit in my book. So I'll leave that as is. Um, but Virginia has not been bad for me. And in a lot of ways, it reminds me of Tennessee, which is where I'm originally from. Mm. Um, I think people forget that a lot of Black people live out in the South. So it's one of those things where, like, you will find very different and varying shades out here. So my experience with colorism has been more pleasant on this coast um, I could not believe, I could not believe what I was seeing and hearing and experiencing when I moved out West. Cause you know, um, the assumption, I never made the assumption, right? Because, you know, I've mm -hmm. lived a couple places my whole life, but the assumption that it's a more progressive out West was very, like very much proven wrong very quickly. So yeah, if I had to pick a place to like stay, it's definitely Virginia or or somewhere on this coast, the East Coast. They are they're very different cultures, and even the Northeast versus the mid mid Atlantic versus the South is very different back there. Yes, yes, and I think that gets glossed over in a lot of conversations around how race is dealt with in this country because yes. it changes the way you can move through the world publicly. Exactly. So we talk a lot of times colorism is limited to a conversation about how it's handled within a, a single group, like the black community or the Indian community, mm -hmm. something like that. Do you find it even in, impacts uh, it's across races and across ethnicity still impact colorism or is for everybody else you're just kind of black? I think I think it's both. I think when you go to certain places, they will just register you as black um, and then that'll be the end of it. Um, but like you mentioned, if you're in countries that also, I mean, colorism is everywhere, obviously, right? But um, if you're in countries that pay very specific attention to that, then yes, you may um, find yourself in some additional shit. Um, I do think there's kind of like, I, what I would say, cross shots that are happening uh, with cultures that are like, you know, highly obsessed with that I guess line of oppression is what I would call it. So I try to I try my best to be in solidarity with any other um, person or culture who has to deal heavily with it because it is a global issue. You know, it doesn't get as much hardcore attention as it should because to some, to some, I put in question, you know, quotations. To some, it's not as obvious because it's not laid ask plainly but I, I would even disagree with that because in some places it's a legit like legitimate like caste system it's just america like kind of plays smoke and mirrors with colorism therefore because some people are only looking at it through an american perspective they're taking that american understanding of colorism and trying to apply it globally which doesn't work so that's what i would say so you've done a lot of unpacking around race around colorism weight fat phobia and this led you to create the Kent scale. So let's start with how did you start doing all of this unpacking? Because you're raised in a world that puts all of this on, treats it like it's normal. Yes. So for you, where did that journey begin to unpack all of this? So um, for the Kent test, I actually, a couple of years ago, I think it was 2019, 2019, I started working on a project with Body for Her. 
um, which was started by Blair Money, and um, she had wanted me in particular to tackle um, some of these issues that we're talking about um, and how they particularly affect the film and media industry, which is, you know, that's mm -hmm. that is what I do. You know, I'm very concerned with mass media, mass media consumption and how it affects us. Right. So she wanted me to do basically like a representation guide, like a whole comprehensive guide to help people, but particularly students, right, help students have the language um, to think about the media that they consume critically. I don't ever think you should look at certain things uncritically. Like, I just think that if it's being fed to you through a screen, especially, you should always be critical of it because everybody has an agenda. You just have to figure out whose agenda you're listening to <laughs> at the moment, right? With her charging me with that mission, I was like, okay, I came up with some questions. I came up with a very, very like expansive list of terminology. Um, later, I would go on to like deal with tropes, right? Which happened recently. But for the test itself, I kept thinking like, okay, we have the Bechdel test. Mm -hmm. But I was like, I don't think it's really sufficient. It was interesting because the creator of the test even said like, hey, I just kind of did this as a gag and then it caught on. Right. And mm -hmm. I understand that. But, you know, people as the years have gone by have applied it seriously. So I'm like, OK, if we're applying it seriously, still does not be able to cover as much as it could. And once again, we're overlooking factors like race and like and gender, especially for black women, how those do a dance together. Right. So I was like, OK, let's do the camp test. Um, I sat for like some weeks looking at my computer, trying to come up with specific questions. And then, like I mentioned, those questions were drawn from tropes I'd seen over and over and over again that were perpetuated against Black female characters. So then I was like, OK, once I had the questions nailed down, I put them in the test. And then for me, it was also important when I was making the test to make sure that the scale wasn't like pass or fail. Right. Because, you know, when you're talking with the general public and you say like you give it like a pass or fail thing, people just stop listening. They get really hypersensitive about it. They like internalize it. And I'm like, you don't need to do all that. Just do better. Right. So that kind of that influenced my decision to just do it like on a number scale. Mm -hmm. So it can be like you didn't necessarily fail. Right. But you didn't do well. You know, you didn't do as well as you probably could have. So. That kind of changes people's mindset um, when they're thinking about these the critical things that I'm bringing up because they're like, oh, OK, so I see where I could have improved here or I see why this mm -hmm. thing that I put in my work, this trope is very ugly. You know, just having mm -hmm. people think critically without getting defensive. That was kind of my uh, mission with the test because, you know, a lot people don't like to admit when they make a mistake it, it make it, it feels like to some people that they're dying or whatever but you know you got to be able to move past that if you want to like progress not just in life but in your work a lot of times people's immaturity um in terms of receiving criticism like that will stop the actual development of their work when i was making the test that's what i was thinking of i was like when when people look at this test i want them to be like hey nothing personal about this test it's all business and According to these tenets, this is where I can improve in this quotations business, right? So that was my mindset. It, you really do cover some of the biggest problematic areas in film when it comes to the representation of Black women. Where are you finding really strong, positive representations of Black women in film lately? Or are you yet? I mean, as of recently, like, to be honest, usually if there's, like, good representation of Black women or Black people in a particular work, it's because it's a Black director. Sometimes it's not always true. You know, as some of us have seen. <laughs> some of us have seen. <laughs> but usually, if, you know, it's a work that has given, like, thoughtful consideration of Black characters is because there's a Black person mm -hmm. either in directly in the writer's seat or they came over the screenplay or they produced. Like, some Black person was on set to make sure that no one put out garbage. One thing that I recommend as of recently is um, Nanny. Girl, forgive me if you hear this interview. Um, I think Nick Yatu Jisoo. She, Nanny's beautiful. Nanny's great. Uh, another thing I would recommend, obviously, is probably anything Ryan Coogler has made ever. <laughs> I love his work. 
I am still trying to see Wakanda forever. Um, it's kind of hard out here with COVID surges happening. Mm-hmm. And you know me, I'm not going to risk my life for a movie. Sorry. So <laughs> I'm waiting on that. But I remember um, how I felt watching uh, Black Panther, the first film. Um, and that film actually came out around the time that the test came out. So it was one of the first films I applied the test to. And it was just one well, one perfect <laughs> eight out of eight across the board. It was great. Those will be p- kind of like people I recommend. Yeah, that's that's what I would recommend off head. I think there are a couple of people, but it's it my mind it's escaping my mind right now. But yeah, those are recent projects or my faves, I would say. As I was preparing for this interview, uh, a couple days ago, the New York Times put out an article on the 10 best actors of 2022. Mm -hmm. And it included both the leads in Nope. And I I wanted to get you to touch on some. There's been all sorts of think pieces and stuff around around the work and around Nope. Uh, What's your take on it? On uh, nope, in like the film in general, or yeah, and, and the the two lead actors, yeah, Daniel and Kiki are just talents. Both of them together individually, so I think that putting them on that list was more than accurate. I haven't seen that list. I hope that they were at the top of that list because they deserve to be at the top of that list. Nope, itself. I did like, I'm not going to lie to you, I did go in with some expectation of something. I can't even tell you what that something was. But, you know, I was pleasantly surprised by the movie, you know, um, as Jordan Peele likes to do. You know, whatever expectation you have, he likes to circumvent it. So finding out that the little cloud wasn't even like, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, wasn't even just a ship. Like, he was his own actual Mm -hmm. entity eating people and things i was like first of all you know because i love a good monster horror right but also Mm -hmm. because it's just like okay so now we're dealing with kind of like a man versus nature thing versus what maybe people's expectation was coming into the film um i also loved how the film touched on spectacle and what we will do to cater to spectacle um, people now call it clock chasing, which I do think is still very yeah. accurate, right? And just thinking about, you know, what we do to animals in particular in the name of, you know, entertainment. So I really, really like that. And I also love the, you know, nod to like forgotten slash erased, I should say, history in terms of Black people in our own film. And then even like one of my mutuals, I think she's called um, If Bill Street Could Twerk. <laughs> she's so funny. <laughs> she she had a whole like thread where she talked about um, the fact that Nope should be read as a Western. And I 100% agree. I love that. I think it's like the f- one of the final shots in the end where you see Daniel Kaluuya on top of that horse in the mist. Little dust, sandy dust. And I was like, excellent shot excellent shot so yeah i think that this is very accurate and i think nope was very good i know people were kind of some people kind of like left head scratching uh, but if you like watch it again i would say rec- i would recommend watching it again you'll be like okay okay i see what's happening but yeah i love i love jordan peele i love his work um i'm always very um fascinated by what he ends up putting on screen whenever i get a chance to go see it so As somebody who grew up with a horse trainer as a mother, this was just this touch me because it's like there's there's so much in it. And there's so many great nods to great horror films throughout and certain shots. And so and the characters are so well developed and they're not over the top and they're in no way a stereotype. And right. Which is in the horror genre is really hard to get. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, we had uh, Gretchen Felker-, Felker Martin on the show, and we were talking about horror, and she does a lot of film criticism around horror and yes. finding good representation of fat folks and good representation of black folks that is not stereotypical is next to impossible. All right. Um, so I like that. So you went, you actually went to school for a degree in film and uh, cultural criticism. Did they address 
things like race and stereotypes when you were going through your education or was this something you had to do on your own? Yeah, so um, so I went to U Chicago and they had, um, when I went, I think I went from 20 to 2016 and cin- they called it Cinema Media Studies because I guess they're good too good to say film. But <laughs> the department was still a very young department by the time I got there. It was one of those things where as a black student in particular, if you wanted that kind of curriculum that you just described, where it does rigor- rigorously talk about race and gender and et cetera, et cetera, like it's it's just something you had to seek out and put together mm-hmm. yourself. Like even there, there was like intro to, you know, film, intro to cinema, there's like history of cinema one, two, like they go over things like that, but like it's the canon for those classes and the curriculum is still very white, still very male. So um, for my electives and et cetera, like I really had to seek that stuff out. Shout out to Jacqueline Stewart. She is, I believe she's she's the president of the Academy right now. Anyways, Professor Jacqueline Stewart, um, look her up. She's great. Um, she actually taught one of the um, African-American history film classes that I took. There were other classes too around like, the Western cowboys forgot history like that and how race factored in. But again, these were classes I had to specifically seek out to enrich my experience. If I had relied on any recommendations or um, any standard curriculum that they may have had in place, I wouldn't have nearly gotten as rich of an education. For folks who are interested in understanding film and the history of film and film criticism, if you had like three or five films to start with, to really give you give people an idea of what's out there, what they may have missed, what would you include in, in your list? Five films. Oh my god, it's always hard because every t- every year, like more films come out, and then my list changes. Oh my god. Okay. Ooh. I would say so five. Okay, bear with me. So I would. This is in no particular order to y'all. Mm-hmm. Like I don't want y'all to be like, oh, she ranked it. No, I didn't. It's unranked. So first of all, I would say the Dark Knight, mainly because I think it was a very interesting way um, to deconstruct the superhero. We've seen many superhero movies. It was interesting to see someone be like, okay, this is a superhero. Let's kind of break down the mythos of what it means to be that, right? So I loved it for that reason. You know, I am, you know, I'm a nerd. So I was definitely taking notes about what I was seeing. I'm trying to pick a rom-com and I'm blanking. I would say either um, Just Like Heaven or what is the other thing? Maybe Pretty Woman. The reason I say that is a Julia Roberts, Julia Roberts, like, that's she's an actress. She makes it look easy because she's so pleasant and, you know, she just has good energy. But, like, a good rom-com is very hard to come by. People think it's an easy genre. It's not. You have to be charming and you do have to be romantic, but it has to be in a way that comes off as sincere. And not a lot of people can do that. I've seen some of these recent rom-coms and I'm like, garbage, get this off my TV. Like, no. <laughs> like, get this off my TV. Not doing it. No. So other than that, let's see. I would say um, set it off. In terms of heist movies, mm-hmm. like, oh my God, I'll be boohooing every time. But it's such a good heist movie because you get all the stakes of the standard heist movie, but they're also very... Um, individualized to each black woman that you see that joins in on this journey of you know robin banks or whatever Mm -hmm. everybody has their own reason for being here um and it's they're all legitimate reasons so we're three true grit um with Haley steinfeld i think it's matt damon and then jeff bridges once again i love westerns there's so many westerns i can name here but i think that was a, a really good recent one that I feel like would in, like introduce a lot of people to the genre in general. Cause you, you know, some people have a thing about watching old movies, you know, watching old movies. Mm-hmm. So sometimes I do try to like get a movie that's like 
recent for them to be like, okay, here's what the genre is like. Do you want to watch more? Okay, if you want to watch more, then yes, you will have to watch quotations old movies, right? Mm-hmm. So that's four. Um, what's my last one? Let's see, horror. Let's talk about horror. I like found footage horror, but there's so much other good horror out there. So I know how we all feel about Ed and Lor- Lorraine. Um, in that story, but I, if I did recommend like a horror film or films, for me, it's either going to be um, The Conjuring or it would be Blair Witch Project or it would be um, something I watched actually very recently. I think it's called um, The Medium. So I believe it's, I want to say it's a Thai film. Don't quote me. You might have to look that up. But um, either any of those three movies work if you're trying to find like a horror film to look at. Blair Witch, for obvious reasons, pioneering the found footage genre. I think found footage lends quotations credibility <laughs> to the film, even if it's obviously fictional. There's something about it to me that um, just makes it really engaging because you, as the person filming or whatever, or trying to, like, get to the bottom of some some horror mystery, right? Um, And it's one of those things where, like, in an ideal world, you would be wrong about the mystery so you don't run into the terrible, horrific thing at the center of what you're looking for. But, you know, usually in the film, they do eventually run into the thing. And seeing how they react to running into the thing that they thought didn't exist is always interesting. (laughs) Um, The Conjuring, I like because of, oh, my God. Oh my God. Vera Famiglia and the actor that plays Ed. I'm sorry. Like, I'm so sorry. But I love their chemistry. But I also love that particular story. And the second one, because um, people forget that at the heart of horror are stories about grief. So you're dealing with family or families, plural, that have been through a lot together or separately. Um, so when you see that and then you come across like the demonic forces that are feeding off of that grief, it just kind of makes you think of like grief itself and how it functions. Like, even if you don't believe in that stuff, right. Um, grief itself is already like a very destructive and haunting force. So I love the movies for that reason. As far as the medium, first of all, I will always prioritize movies that, you know, are directed or written or about um black people or, or um non-white people anything that is non-white is going to move up to the top of my mm-hmm. list um but for medium in general it is so scary like it had been a while i watched it this year right and it had been a while where i was really scared watching a horror movie and this one really scared me on multiple levels like the story was good itself um as a scary story like the effects the twists and the turns. It was also like shot like documentary slash found footage style too. It's just so good. It's so good. And I always love um, watching creators take familiar genres or templates and just like flip it on its head. So it's one of those things where like, if you're interested in, again, getting into horror and learning what the genre is all about, I would probably recommend any of those last three. But yeah, I think that name five. So that will be... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. I know it took me a minute, but plus a yeah. few extras. Yeah. So spattered. Yeah. Basically, this is how I get my watch list. <laughs> I've gotten so many good recommendations from guests because it's it's really gets exhausting watching cis heteronormative films for it you know, now that I've watched all of Netflix or whatever, um, thanks to the pandemic. They they brought back some of these older ones, and I've tried to go back and watch stuff that I watched 20, 30 years ago, and it, oh, I can't. I've got to shut it off. It's so bad with, you know, as you learn and grow, it's like, I, I can't do this anymore. Like, if you don't have a queer person have a happy ending, I really don't want to watch your shit. Yeah, like, I feel very similar in terms of um, women in film, too. Um, I actually had this conversation with my sister very recently because we were trying to find good films to watch and it's one of those things where like we had a very bad stretch where like you know trigger warning we would pick something and like 
it was clear something bad was about to happen to one of the female characters and we just like turned the shit off. We'd be like, I don't want to, I don't even, I don't even want to deal with anything being implied. Like I'm, I'm good. So it was really bad. Like there, it was like three, four or five films in a row where we're like, is ep- are y'all going to do this in every film? Like, do I have to dodge every other film to make sure I'm not accosted with right. any of this? Like it's bad. It's very bad. Um, especially in the streaming era, it is bad. I was like, at this point, I'm about to go rewatch Bojack Horseman again. Cause you know, like, <laughs> like I just, <laughs> I'm just, cause you know, I do try to watch new things. I think people forget that they'd be like, oh, you're going to watch the same thing again. Well, if that means I'm not going to run into this bullshit, y'all keep trying to feed me, then yes, I will watch this show again. Um, it was, I was so irritated because I was like, it'd been one thing. It was like one or two movies, three, four, five in a row. And I'm like, okay, we're going to take a break. We're going to take a break. I'm just going to go watch something again because I'm not doing this. I'm not going to keep traumatizing myself trying to find something to watch. Yeah, no, it's same because it's just like, oh, I just, I can't barrel through this. And I... I can't turn off that critical part of my brain and just go numb and watch a film. Like there's stuff that just will jump off the screen anymore. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. When I was younger, I, um, you know, I was probably better, I guess at that. Cause you know, I wasn't thinking as critically about it, but yeah, now I'm just like, no, because again, the stuff you put out there, whether people like to hear it or not, it does have consequences. So, uh, you know, me and you are talking about this critically, right. But imagine, you know, someone younger, than us that is also encountering these same films I'm talking about back to back to back to back. Like, what are they going to be mm-hmm. thinking? They're going to be desensitized to that. Mm-hmm. So I just, it's, it's, mm, it's not good. <laughs> not good. Not good. So we are coming to the end of time. You are putting a book out. It is a memoir. Uh, do you want to tell the folks a little bit about it? Because it's coming out. It'll come out a few weeks after this drops mm-hmm. so people can pre-order and get excited. I've already Yay! pre-ordered. Yay! Thank you so much. Um, so, again, Fat Off, Fat On is a memoir. Say it again. Fat Off, Fat On, Big, Big Bitch Manifesto is a memoir of mine. I basically walk you through, like, some of the beginning portraits of my life towards, like, basically me moving back south because at a certain point I leave the south to go out west and kind of figure myself out what I want to do um for work and how I want to use my <laughs> degree my like sixty thousand dollar degree expensive piece of paper um <laughs> that I got from the university and like I mentioned earlier you know I use my snapshots of my life to kind of dive into fat phobia and how it like uniquely affects dark skinned people, mentally ill people, like you mentioned, um, disabled people, like just thinking about those type of intersections um, and how, you know, how they in small or big ways influence your life. So, you know, obviously I do try to, again, make it as juicy as possible because, you know, you want the memoir to be good if you want to, you know, if you have to read it, right? So that's kind of my thing. I didn't want to tell these different stories and explain slash describe um, these oppressive systems um, without boring people, too. Um, that's always important to me. I'm like, you know, you want this kind of stuff to be interesting. So, yeah, that's what I would say about it. I've been told by many of my peers that it is, in fact, as juicy as I want it to be. So, <laughs> so I'm very proud of that. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like the skinny, I guess, on the memoir. Plug all the things, plug the book, plug the social media, all the good awesome. stuff. Okay, so for the book, once again, it's titled Fat Off, Fat On a Big Bitch Manifesto. You can get it from the Feminist Press website. I actually prefer you get it from there because they're an indie publication. We want to support them. If you must, you know, I get it. I get it. Well, if you must, it is also available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble, Bookshop, Books a Million. Basically, anywhere that sells books is very likely it'll be there. If it's not, you can actually request it. Um, same thing with the library. I think people forget that, you know, libraries also have to order slash buy these books so they can be in stock. So if there's a library near you and you want to be able to have it stocked or you want other people to be able to 
borrow it, make sure you request at the local library. All you need is like my name, the title of the book, and then the um, ISBN. Um, you can get the nine coded, I think it's eight or nine coded, or you can get the 13 coded one. Either way, that works as far as socials. So I am trying to transition away from Twitter, but until I can, I am still on Twitter at I write all day underscore. Um, I'm on IG as Karkisha Kent. I am on Tumblr. Had to <laughs> had to go back and brush that one back off at I write all day no underscore. Um, I'm on Hive slash Hive Social as um, Karkisha Kent. I was on Mastodon, but we're not gonna bring that up. <laughs> we're not gonna bring that. Up. <laughs> I think that's it. Those are my mains. Oh, I am on TikTok at Karkisha Kent, but that's private for now i have to figure out if i'm gonna open the account because tiktok is a very interesting app i don't really like it but there are very brilliant minds on that app so that's what has me torn i'm like y'all really smart until you're not <laughs> some of the things i see <laughs> on the app but yeah those are my socials that's the book and yeah um i would also like to plug my agent too claire draper you know, mm-hmm. every so often they do take on new clients. Um, so I want to put them out there. They work for the vet agency. They are great agents. I've quite literally gotten all the things I wanted, <laughs> especially in terms of rights, um, with them at the helm of my, you know, literary career. So I definitely want to give them props. Excellent, excellent. And yes, uh Clarkish is great follow on Twitter. I, I do follow her there. And pre-order the book. We'll have all the links up. We'll have it linked to CUNY Feminist Press because they happen to be a CUNY alum. So I will continue to support that in independent bookstores. And yeah, follow, drop, you know, follow her on all the things, pick up the book, and congratulations on getting your memoir out there. It's been great Thank to have you. you on. It's been great to be on. Thank you so much. And now, a moment of gratitude. What I am grateful for, I will say, is my community, both offline and online. Recently, I just I just suffered like a, just a string of random misfortunes that really pissed me off. Um, I think the pinnacle of it for me was when um, my car a few weeks ago was involved in a hit and run, just randomly somebody it looks like they clearly jumped a curb and just hit my shit and then kept it moving and it was bad like it's fucked up and i was at a spot financially where i just could not cover it because it had come at a really weird time and my checks were spaced out because i still do freelancing work so you know i went online i was like hey y'all i need help you know i was expecting too much help but yeah like within i should you not like hours People had put enough money for me to essentially take my car. I didn't have to wait around for like my checks to come to me, right? They gave me enough money to like send my car straight to the um, body shop where I need to go and get fixed. So I don't take stuff like that lightly because not everyone can, not everyone has that rich a support system. So that's what I would say I'm grateful for this year because it's been a tough, it's been a tough year. Not just for me, but for a lot of different people. Like every person I've talked to was like, yeah, this year's a wash. I can't wait till next year. I can't wait till 2023. So yeah, I'm very, very, very grateful to my community. All y'all who can hear me, very grateful for y'all. I I honestly I would not have made it through this year without them. It was it was not a good year for me. Thank you for listening to this episode of Fat Chicks on Top. Please like, subscribe, and review our podcast on whatever platform you listen to it on. If we like your review, we may even read it online. This has been an Auntie Vice production. Producer and host, Rebecca Blanton. Audio production by Sharon Smith. Music by David Manga. And more music by Sharon Smith. For more information about Fat Chicks on Top, please visit our website for all things Fat Chicks 
at fatchicksontop.com.